A few prenotande, prenotes. Missions, maybe you're feeling a little pressure in a mission. That's good. You know, one of the ways we discern the spirits in the church, if you read the lives of the saints, is that one of the ways they knew that it was of God, that they were receiving this grace, was that they were filled, uh, filled with a certain fear when the angel came or when the Blessed Mother appeared to them. They felt a certain fear. They felt a certain pressure. They felt a certain weight upon them. But then after the Lord started to speak through the angel or through his blessed mother, they felt an uprising. They felt joy come in their heart. So fear and pressure preceded joy and happiness. Now with the devil, it's just the opposite. It's flipped over. He comes, he makes you feel good at the beginning. And then after it's over and he leaves, you feel kind of something's not right. You feel a distaste. You feel a fear in your heart. Okay, so the mission is like that. We're here to put some pressure on you. Squish out the immaturity in you. Then, at the end of the mission, you're filled with love. Filled with joy and ready to serve the Lord with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. So if you feel that pressure, we're going to put a little on you tonight. That's not so bad. That's good. That's how a mission works. In fact, one old priest told me once, he said, a mission is basically this. You go, you tell everybody you're going to hell. That's how you start. But then at the end of the mission, you say, if you follow what we said, you do all the things you need to do, you're going to heaven. So at the beginning, it seems like you're going to hell. By the time you're done, you're going to heaven. Okay, that's what I want for you. So stick with it all the way to the end and God will fill your heart with joy. Let us take our reading from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. May he who hath begun a good work in you perfect it unto the day of Christ Jesus. And this I pray that your charity may more and more abound in knowledge and in all understanding that you may approve the better things that you may be sincere and without offense unto the day of Christ. Words of St. Paul. Now, last evening, we heard how the Lord's kingdom is none other than the Holy Roman Catholic Church, the city of God, the mystical body of Christ, the king, encompassing both heaven and earth. Tonight, we need to consider how that kingdom works on the inside, in the individual member of the city of God. As his majesty himself said, For lo, the kingdom of God is within you. To put it in another way, the king needs a castle. Kings live in castles. St. Teresa of Jesus, the great Carmelite mystic and doctor of the church, she received a heavenly inspiration to describe the soul infused by God's grace as the interior castle of his majesty. It's a wonderful book if you haven't read it. Now, this means that the souls of the baptized, the faithful of Christ the King, are his castles. His majesty said, if anyone love me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and we'll make our abode with him. In another place, we are told his delight is to be with the children of men. Not just to be with them, aside them, to be in them. He delights to be in home, in his castle. So we ask ourselves, is he welcome? Is he welcome? Is he loved? Is he adored? In our castles. The castle of our body and our soul. Now, we also know from Scripture that the lives of the saints, and from the lives of the saints... That his majesty is a jealous king. He's a very jealous king. You wouldn't want to cross him. And he admits then no other lover. When you're jealous, you admit no other lover. 
If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, and yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. You are his castle. There are no idols allowed. St. Teresa describes the interior castle as having seven mansions or dwelling places with his majesty taking up his presence in the throne room, which is where in the seventh mansion, in the center, in the heart, at the core of our being, the very inner court. That's the seventh mansion. When the soul has attained the sacred place. It enters into the mystical union, the mystical marriage with its king. Such souls are already in this life, even as close to heaven as they can get. They're practically there already. They've tasted heaven. Such souls become Martha and Mary, says St. Teresa, filled with contemplative prayer while yet performing good and heroic works for the king And his kingdom. They're insatiable in prayer and doing good works. An easy way to view this castle and how it works is to see it in relation to the days of creation. If we think about this, we look in the life of Moses. Moses goes up on the mountain. There's a cloud and he has to sit there for six days. But then on the seventh day, he goes into the inner cloud And he is in union with God. There it is. Scriptural reference to what I'm trying to say here. And furthermore, St. John of the Cross calls the cosmos, the universe, a palace for the bride, the church. Thus, the days of creation can tell us something about the king's interior cosmic palace or castle. In the divinely inspired account of creation, which is what Moses gave us in Genesis, God would not lie to us. Our king would not trick us. He would not deceive us. When he said creation was in six days, he means it. It's not some kind of play on words. Well, if you look at the divinely inspired account of creation, water played a key role in the making of the king's exterior cosmic palace. Similarly, it is through the waters of baptism that we enter into the interior castle of the king. Seeking to be wed to him in grace and glory by making our way to rest, to rest with him on the seventh day. Now, this rest, the seventh mansion, this is not rest as we think of it in a worldly sense, which is a lack of action. No, it's resting in total love, total truth, harmony, unity. And in the supreme delight, which is God, with total forgetfulness of self. Baptism is essential to attaining this restful happiness. At our baptism, Christ, our king, was enthroned in our hearts, making this journey possible. Mm, How good it is to be Catholic. Do we understand? We're castles for the king. Let us cherish this gift and long for the whole world to share in this grace. Now, to arrive at the seventh mansion, the day of rest, the mystical marriage, the king's subject must reach an inner harmony, an inner order that allows the soul to be wed to such a great and awesome king. To the king of kings who cannot admit any other lover. No inordinate self-love allowed. No inordinate of love, inordinate love of creatures allowed, no matter who they are. Adam and Eve were created on the sixth day, as it were, in the sixth mansion. They were right on the edge of the mystical union. That everything needed to make it to the next mansion, the next day, to the mystical marriage, but... But we know the story. Eve, listening to the devil, the father of lies, looked at the forbidden fruit. She formed a desire, took and ate what she knew was contrary to God's command. 
Her head, laboring under a lie of the devil, allowed her heart to follow her lower desires. She found another lover. Herself. The king said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, Adam quickly followed Eve by choosing her, his wife, as his other lover, over his God, over his majesty. They both lost their inner harmony. They both lost their privileged place in the garden. They both lost their garments of grace. And they were both expelled. This we call the original sin. The sin that forever inclines man to seek another lover. And alas, alas, how many lovers, how many mistresses has man had ever since? I remember one priest I know, he said he was going to high school and they told him it was all about love, 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 love. And he said they went out and they loved everything in sight. How many mistresses has man had? With baptism, however, we are allowed to start again. At the first day. In the first mansion. But keep in mind, How on that first day, God separated light from darkness. In other words, God made the angels on that day and light. That's the good angels. And they were separated from darkness. That's the bad angels. So it is the day the devil fell from heaven like lightning. First day of creation. Now, this means the devil is the most powerful against us in that first mansion. Because as St. Teresa explains, that is where the windows of the soul are located. The senses through which we look out into the world ever seeking another lover. The windows of the soul are the senses of man, his sight, his hearing, his touch, his taste, his smell. And through these, we are most easily lured out of the castle by worldly loves and worldly lovers. We take our delight in them. We stop seeking the king inside and we rest fitfully in some worldly love. That's how you know. It's one of the ways you know you've committed a mortal sin. Is that you rest. You rest in the good that you have sought that is not God. And you go, ah, that's how you know. This is mortal sin. At first, such acts give some passing delight, some rest. But before long, that rest vanishes and man seeks yet another mistress. On the other hand, the further we go down into the interior castle to be with our king, the more we conquer the devil and the harder it is for him to draw us out again. The further you go down, the harder it is for him to get you. That's a good motivation. Let's get down there. Our hearts are restless until they rest with the Lord. They rest with him in the seventh mansion. Now to go deeper, we need inner harmony. When we enter inside the king's castle, we need the powers and the faculties of our soul. They need to be in good order, but they're not because of Adam's sin. Furthermore, St. Teresa says there are many poisonous snakes, beasts and monsters that come in with us that will give us a deadly bite sooner or later unless we go deeper. These monsters are in the first mansions. They die out as you go deeper. These are things like bad habits, stain of sin caused by our impurities, living in a near occasion of sin. We get rid of that stuff. Furthermore, the devil is always trying to tempt us to come out. He doesn't have to work very hard today. He's always barraging our senses through TV, movies, Internet, iPhones, iPods, iPads. He does not have to work very hard. To make headway, therefore, the powers in the soul must be put in good order. Now, St. Teresa of Jesus And others like Saint, like her, like Saint Catherine of Genoa, they looked upon the various faculties, powers, appetites in the soul as well as the body. They looked upon these as being like people. 
in the castle. They're like people. She explains how the more these people live in harmony, in unity, the more perfect the soul becomes, the more easily it arrives at the king's throne room to wed him forever. This harmony, however, can only come from the king himself, and it belong, and it begins with sanctifying grace, once again, that we receive through baptism and we strengthen through the sacraments. Furthermore, if these people in our soul are to get along, each and every one of them must subject themselves to the king and swear fealty to him. Intellect, swear fealty to the king. Faith, heart, swear fealty to the king. Charity, memory, swear fealty to the king. Hope, body, swear fealty to the king. Purity, temperance, courage. Now, Pope Pius XI, he explained it like this. If to Christ our Lord is given all power in heaven and on earth, if all men purchased by his precious blood are by our new right subjected to his dominion, if this power embraces all men, it must be clear that not one of our faculties is exempt from his empire. So if everything on the outside is subject to the king, so must everything on the inside. All those people in there need to subject themselves to Christ. Cosmic palace on the outside, cosmic palace on the inside. You see how that works? That's beautiful. Thank you, Pope Pius. He continues, he must reign in our minds, which should assent with perfect submission and firm belief to reveal truths and to the doctrines of Christ. He must reign in our wills, which should obey the laws and precepts of God. He must reign in our hearts, which should spurn natural desires and love God above all things and cleave to him alone. He must reign in our bodies and in our members, which should serve as instruments for the interior sanctification of our souls. Pope Pius XI, Quas Primus. Now, there are at least two very important principles. If we can get our mind around these, we're going to be doing pretty good. There are at least two very important principles when accepted and embraced. Enable the people of the soul to get along in good harmony, even perfect harmony. Well, the first principle is simply this. There is a fixed hierarchy in man. Just as there's a hierarchy in the world around us, so is there inside of us. The head, the mind, the intellect takes the highest place, followed by the heart, the will, while the memory, the imagination, the appetites or passions, the senses and the body serve them as underlings. Thus, the agreement between the head and the heart is of key importance to making the journey to the seventh mansion, a seventh day of rest, possible. Sin occurs when the heart does something the head knows is wrong. We know that. When I do something I know it's wrong, that's sin. Eve took and ate when she knew she should not. Rebellion occurs when the people on the lower level rise up against their head, causing disorder and division in the soul. It leads to unrest. And thus the saying of St. Augustine once again, Our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they rest with you, until they rest in that established order that you have set inside of us. Now, the second principle is this. So first principle, hierarchy. Second principle. It is the right and the duty of kings to command. Kings issue orders. That's what they do. They give edicts and laws. The mind receives them while the heart must carry them out. Our Lord and King has given us clear orders and laws, and he summarized them with the two great commandments. To love God and to love our neighbor. And if we love him, we will keep his commandments, he said. So in addition to these two principles, man needs a connection between his head and his heart to keep them together. The neck is this connection. And this neck is our conscience. 
Conscience is an act of our intellect in the head by which a judgment is applied to an action in the heart. See, it's connection. Whether that action be in the future, whether it be in the present or in the past, that's how conscience works. Such that the conscience helps us determine whether that action is good or evil, whether this act keeps head and heart together or not. It is a specific act of the mind applying its knowledge to a concrete moral situation. It does not force the heart, but tells it what it ought to do or what it ought to avoid. That's what conscience does. That's the neck. Now, what the conscience decides in any given case depends on the commands given to it by the king. In other words, the conscience needs a basis on which to make a judgment And this foundation is first and foremost the natural law, how things are made by God. This natural law is summarized by the Ten Commandments. In his kindness toward us, our king has given us all his commands, even those of the natural law through his divine revelation and his teachings of his church. And so in doing this, he put confusion to flight. There's no question for error. It's all been given to us. Conscience does not produce these principles or commandments. It accepts them. Nor does conscience pass judgment on the truths of reason and divine faith. It uses them as the premises from which to conclude whether something should be done because it's good or something should be avoided because it's bad. So the conscience of man cannot validly be put in opposition to the word of God, to the teachings of the church. That is impossible. The voice of the king has spoken through the natural law, through his church. He's given a command. Conscience receives it. Thus, the common term for the conscience is the voice of God. Blessed Cardinal Newman called it the aboriginal vicar of Christ. With the command not to eat of the fruit of the tree in Genesis, divine revelation teaches us that the power to decide what is good and evil does not belong to man, but to God. To God alone. In other words, there's no such thing as an autonomous conscience. That's a trick of the devil. Now, it is inescapably connected to the king. That's the conscience. It's inescapably connected. He gives commands, the conscience carries them out. Now, the fathers of the church, they give the centurion of the gospel as an example of what St. Teresa and Pope Pius are teaching about in the interior castle of the king. This is what they say. Desert fathers, be like the centurion, seated high in humility, commanding your servants to passions. Go, and they go. Or come, and they come. Or to our tyrant and slave the body, do this, and it does it. Don't you want that dominion over yourself? Wake up in the morning, get up, you get up. Think about it. When all the people in the soul are ordered and in harmony, man does not easily commit sin. He finds lasting and true rest. He finds peace of soul, union with the king, and ultimately Mystical marriage. On the other hand, sin and unrest come easily to man when the people of the soul forget God. They become distracted by many worldly concerns, pains and pleasures alike, and by other loves. Such that they stop listening to the king's commands. His voice becomes more and more faint. Sadly, some, like Rene Descartes, who we talked about on Sunday, who famously said, I think, therefore I am, will even ignore the king because his ideas do not match their own. I got my rights. And if it is not my idea, I'm not going to do it. I got my rights. This is rebellion in the mind of man. This is rationalism. This is pride. I think, therefore, I am. I'll decide what I'm going to do. 
Even more tragic, others will follow the example of the infamous Aleister Crowley, cultist and author of the Black Bible, who learned a new law directly from the devil. He wasn't listening to the king. He was listening to the devil. He summarized this law as follows. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. I got my rights. If it's not my will, I'm not going to do it. I will not serve. I have no king but Caesar. This is rebellion in man's hearts. This is liberalism. Freedom from God. Today, dialogue. You can think of it like this. Dialogue is the name of the game. Democracy is the way to govern the people. Hierarchy is out. Egalitarianism is in. That's where everything's equal. Straight across the board. Give those lower people in the soul a voice. Thus the clamoring passions get a say as to what should be done and avoided. And we know how they vote. They seek what is pleasurable and desirable while avoiding suffering, pain, and penances. Anything but that? No, Father, don't do it. Cold shower? No, that's too painful. Get up early in the morning? No, sleep in. That's what they say. They want to fill the senses with delights and new things. Always new. Flashy. They cry out, mitigate, mitigate, mitigate to all discipline. No more penance, no more silence. Lighten up. Take it easy. You've heard that voice. You know it well. What is the result? Such dialogue and democracy quickly leads to regicide. The commands of the king are ignored, explained away, or even ridiculed. You don't believe that anymore. You don't actually do that, do you? Come on. The king is deposed, and then he's killed in mortal sin. There follows a separation of church and state in the soul. The people of the soul put a governor in the king's place, a Pontius Pilate, who will give heed to their clamoring for Barabbas, a murderer, instead of their king and all his holy teaching. Pilate inevitably gives way under the pressure. Pilate quickly finds reasons for his ways of thinking. And modern psychology always comes to his aid. Giving in to your instincts is good. It's healthy. It's not bad. He also reasons everyone's doing it. It must be okay. They want this. They voted. Barabbas it is. Well, I had to do that to keep the peace in my kingdom. I had to commit that impure act, do a good night's rest. Or since the majority opinion was in favor, it was for the common good. Yet about three days later, our dear Lord and King, rising from the grave, the conscience returns to life to haunt Pilate's weak and empty rationalizations. Pilate becomes filled with unrest and fear. He becomes depressed. The voice of God, that aboriginal vicar of Christ, speaks. The result of this dialogue of democracy in the king's castle is disastrous. In other words, not only do the people proceed to put the king to a painful death and cast him out of their city, but these people soon find themselves divided. There's war in the soul. They fight each other, not allowing any peace in the now cold, dark and dreary castle. Sometimes a frightening, dark and demonic overlord comes to possess the castle as his own. Furthermore, it works outward. It spreads outward. Man becomes divided with his fellow man, causing spouses, families, nations, parishes, all to be at odds with each other. We're all fighting each other now. St. Peter puts it like this. 
Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims to this world to refrain yourselves from carnal desires which war against the soul. St. James puts it like this. From whence are wars and contentions among you? Are they not hence from your concupiscence? Inordinate desires which war in your members? What can we do to prevent this inner war and become a centurion? Enthrone the king in your hearts by making a sincere and integral confession if you've not done so. With Christ on his rightful throne, we must then seek to listen to his voice. To fortify our head with the true faith and inform our neck of the king's commands, all of them. Do not trust the ambiguous writings, speeches, and words floating about in our times. Instead, read. Read the lives and the works of the saints. Tap into the memory of the church. Learn and memorize what has always been taught and held dear to her from time immemorial. And your castle will be greatly fortified, a most fitting home for the king of kings. Now, furthermore... With the Christ, the king, enthroned in his castle like the centurion of old, we must put an end to all dialogue and democracy. With those slaves, our passions, senses, and our bodies. With the king's presence in our interior castle of our souls, the hierarchy must be observed and maintained. And this takes penance. This takes mortification. Let those people down there know who is boss. If they clamor for this, you give them that. If they want to go left, you go right. If they want to go down, you go up. Fight. St. Augustine says, The man who lets himself do everything that is allowed will very soon become slack and do what is not allowed. His majesty said, if thy right eye scandalize thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is expedient for thee that thou, that one of thy members should perish rather than thy whole body be cast into hell. St. Paul said, I chastise my body and bring it into subjection. Furthermore, to keep the heart in line, to keep it on the path to the king and that interior castle. We must make sure we do not forget God, who is both in heaven above and in the seventh mansion of our souls. And this requires we exercise a certain double vision. Now, double vision is defined as the simultaneous perception of two images, usually overlapping, of a single scene or object. You've had Double take on something before. Now, maybe this is why God gave us two eyes to symbolize the need for this double vision that I'm going to talk about. His majesty possessed just such a twofold vision in one eye. He always saw the purpose of his life. The glory of God, the father. Now, it's the teaching of the saints and the doctors that our dear Lord always beheld the beatific vision his entire life. From the beginning to the end, even when he was dying on the cross, he could see God in heaven. Now, the other eye looked at all his actions on this earth, most notably, as they were ordered to Calvary. To Calvary. That would bring God, his father, the most glory. Thus, throughout his life, he often spoke in signs and words of his hour, of his passion. At his transfiguration on Mount Tabor, he spoke of his exodus from this world. These images of heaven and Calvary overlapped. He had double vision. All was ordered to the same end, the glory of God. Now, the saints were not slow to imitate their king, to adjust their vision, to capture two objects. Keeping one eye always focused on their death or their judgment, while the other focused on God Above. So St. Benedict, for example, encouraged this double vision by using the judgment day no less than ten times in his rule for monks. 
warning the abbot and various office holders that they would have to render an account to God both for themselves and those under their care. In another place, he says, the highest degree of humility, the 12th degree, is attained when he, the monk, is ever holding himself guilty of his sins, thinking that he is already standing before the dread judgment seat of God. Rule of St. Benedict. A healthy fear of judgment brings the highest levels of humility and holiness. This is precisely why we started this talk with St. Paul saying to the Philippians, may he who has begun a good work in you, when did he do that? Baptism. Perfected unto the day of Christ Jesus, the judgment day. This I pray that your charity may more and more abound in knowledge. May you go deeper in the castle and in all understanding. May your head and heart be connected that you may approve the better things. May your neck be operative. May your conscience be working that you may be sincere and without offense unto the day of Christ. Double vision. Think about the judgment day. We finally have reached our bookmark. We left on Sunday night. So by keeping one eye focused on the day of judgment and the other focused on our king or on the particular action we're doing in union with that end. We will conquer every difficulty. The hierarchy of our castles will be preserved. Uprisings and temptations to give way to a more democratic approach will be suppressed. By practicing this twofold vision, we quickly become more and more acceptable to his majesty, our king. We become recollected. We're aware of his indwelling presence, unwilling to lose him, unwilling to sacrifice him, unwilling to hurt him, enabling us to do all with him and in him and through him. He becomes the purpose for all we do because we were made for him. His rights become primary. Cosmology for the saints always becomes Christology. Now, the great thinkers like Thomas Aquinas teach us that a man is worth what he seeks as his end. What is a useless being? One that does not correspond to the end for which he was created. What is a useless being? One who does not correspond to the end for which he was created. The end of man is to know God, to love God, to adore God and serve God so that he will be forever happy with God in heaven. With God as man's supreme end, we must refer all to him and place in him our soul happiness. All else is vanity of vanities. Insofar as we fail to do this, we are useless. It is vain that we spend ourselves, even though this spending of ourselves should appear remarkable in the sight of the world. In God's sight, it would be that of a profitless being who did not fulfill the reason for his existence. Now, as we've learned in the general judgment, it will expose such things with great precision. It will put all this on display that was ordered to the king and deserves to remain as a part of his kingdom, as well as all that was not ordered to him and so must be destroyed. Now, listen to St. Paul. This is from St. Paul. First letter to the Corinthians. For other foundation no man can lay but that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be manifest. For the day of the Lord shall declare it, because it shall be revealed in fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. St. Paul. So at the last judgment, a man will be judged or honored because he's a great president, charismatic leader, scientist, athlete, general, journalist. 
All these honors and distinctions held in high esteem by the world will be deemed of no value or merit. Men will be praised and honored solely for their virtue and good works and how much they cooperated with the king and how they sought to cover him in glory. Think about that next time you watch the Oscars. How is this bringing glory to God? How much did they order all things to him? Think about it. At the last, on that day, at that last day, it will be seen by all and understood by all what is the worth of sensual indulgence versus self-restraint. All will see what retribution falls upon those who indulge the lower people of the soul versus the crown and the glory purchased by those who mortified them. Then it will be seen what home gluttony and luxury, dialogue and democracy have built for themselves. It will be clearly known because the eternal sentences will be written in the very resurrected bodies of the just and the wicked. The simple sight of that glory on the one hand and the foulness and ignominy on the other will proclaim to the whole universe what shall be the eternal pleasures and the eternal pains of the sheep and the goats, of those who submitted to Christ's kingdom within and the liberals who revolted. To avoid joining that dark and degraded choir, let's consider a few ways we can develop our double vision. We've reached the pinnacle of this sermon. This is one of the most important things I want you to learn. We need to learn how to use our double vision to keep our head and heart connected using the neck God gave us. Now, the basic method employed by the saints is simply this. They were forever asking themselves this simple question. You know it. What is this to all eternity? Whatever action you're going to do, whatever is being, you're being tempted or confronted with, what is this to all eternity? What will I think of this on my deathbed? Or how will this look on judgment day? Ask yourself that frequently. King David puts it like this in the Psalms. O Lord, make me know my end. And what is the number of my days that I may know what is wanting to me? Okay, so let's spend the rest of our time practicing our double visions. We're going to go through four cases to get you used to it. I can't do everything. That's too much time. Okay, first case. We are struggling. Let's consider. Maybe you're not struggling this way, but people do. We are struggling whether to go to Holy Mass to fulfill our obligation to worship God as he taught us. Of course, we could take the path of Descartes, thinking to ourselves, well, going to Mass is not my idea. Therefore, I will find something else I like. I got my rights! Or we could be like creepy Al Crowley. This obligation was laid upon me from outside. No thanks. I will only commit to my own self-determined obligations. I have my rights. Such folks then find a new end in life. A new lover. Self. They stay home and they watch some sporting event. Or maybe they go shopping. Or get involved in sports as a replacement obligation that they choose. Or some other thing. Maybe they stay home and pray. I don't know. Such poor sinners have no double vision. But let us not forget Pilate. Three days later, the king rose up and he was put to confusion. Now, using both eyes, we will quickly realize that the Holy Mass connects us to Calvary and to heaven. It is the closest we can come to the end for which we were made while still on the way. You will not get closer to heaven than you do at Mass. If God is the end in which we find hope to find perfect rest on the seventh day, then by attending the Holy Mass, we're practicing for that day. When we pass from this world to the next, 
where they spend all their being adoring and worshiping God. It's like one long mass in a way. Thus, on the day of judgment, we will see how the mass was the best of all preparations for that day. We will see how much we pleased the king by coming when we didn't feel like it. Observing his rights first and foremost. We will see how all the graces we require to remain a lover of the king flowed from the holy mass. And how our worthy communion strengthened his presence in our hearts. And how our obedience brought him glory. That will be seen. Now place yourself on that day and look back on the masses you have attended. What will you see? Surely you will see how badly people behave in the presence of such infinite goodness. Think about it. Who dares to talk of trivial matters before the throne of God? And yet how easily people talk in church, make unneeded visits to the bathroom, dress inappropriately, daydream about worldly things. (coughs) If Peter was later chagrined and embarrassed for his suggestion to set up three tents on Mount Tabor, what will our embarrassment be? Hmm? What will our embarrassment be for all the trivialities and banalities that we gave way to while at Mass before the very throne of the King? May these infidelities not be repeated. But to provide a little comfort, I also think, that we will look back on those masses and we will be surprised at how many demons were hovering around. Don't forget, mass is a representation of Calvary too. And there were demons on Calvary. It gives new meaning to the Asperges. Oh, how important it is. Okay, first case. Tenants at Holy Mass. Second case. How about this? A lot of broken... Families today or people lost their faith. Now the children are all going off and getting married outside the church. Hmm. Should I attend the wedding of a Catholic relative attempting a marriage outside the church? This is a big problem today. What if they're my son or my daughter? Heartache, I know. Sad to say, various family members now decide not to follow the example of the first sacramental wedding at Cana in Galilee, causing their family much pain. I suggest, moms and dads, you tell your children now, I'm not going to your wedding if you get married outside the church. Let them know way ahead of time. Well, now think about it. At the first wedding at Cana in Galilee, they invited the mother of God and his majesty, the king, along with his disciples. Each of these persons stand for something. Okay, the blessed mother, her presence at the church is the church at the wedding. She represents the wedding as of the church. The presence of Jesus means a priest must witness the exchange of vows. And the disciples are the witnesses. Now, the water turned into wine means the wedding is made before the altar of sacrifice. So the first thing the married couple does together is attend the Holy Mass and receive Holy Communion. They're getting married to do the king's bidding, to follow his rights and give him glory. That's why they started the mass. Without the first three, there is no valid wedding. So you have a child that wants to get married outside church. Are are you, are you inviting Mary, the blessed mother, the church? You're not. I can't go. Sorry. Are you inviting Jesus? There's no priest. You don't want Jesus at your wedding? Now, using our double vision on the judgment day, it will be shown that invalid unions led to innumerable evils, casting long shadows upon the world. Now, think of King Henry VIII. The effects of his invalid marriages are still very much with the world today. Five centuries later, bad marriages lead to a multiplication of mortal sins. They lead to adultery, contraception, sterilization, abortion, often to multiple divorces and yet even more unsuccessful unions, multiple lawsuits, children that are apart from their parents and confused about what is right and wrong, about what a true marriage looks like. Evils that contribute to the destruction of families and whole nations. 
By witnessing such an unholy affair, we will give our stamp of approval. Let us use our double vision and think of that day before the king. Better not to go. Better to stay with him. My kingdom is not of this world. And let the relatives know this behavior is unacceptable to our Lord. That it's wrong to place our end in another human being as Adam did to Eve. Second case, should I go to the marriage? Double vision makes it clear. Third case, temptation to sin against the flesh. Immodesty is everywhere in our times. Bad pictures are available even on the smallest of handheld devices. Now remember, Adam chose Eve over God. He is inclined toward the woman and her beauty. And she's inclined to show it. And be vain about it. So many today lacking double vision place themselves in near occasions of sin, whether it be in dating, keeping close company with others, dressing immodestly or exposing themselves to shameful pictures and movies. We should always remember the widest gate to hell is labeled lust. Using our double vision, however, let's use our double vision. This too can be readily conquered. We ask ourselves, What is the flesh to all eternity? The body grows old. It loses its beauty. It dies. It rots. Do we really want to place our happiness in bodily pleasures? On judgment day, we will see with perfect clarity where these sins lead. Violence, wars, destruction. The five cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed for this reason. Sins of the flesh led to the deluge that Noah and his family escaped. It always starts with the sins of the flesh. But even more to the point, let us ask, using our double vision, what is the marital act really for? What is the marital act to all eternity? Well, let's look at heaven. Let's look at the day of judgment. There's no giving or taking in marriage in heaven. No use of our sexuality in the next life. Yet heaven and the day of judgment are all about people, aren't they? They're all about people. The marital act has one lasting effect. It cooperates with God to make a man. The marital act, therefore, is about making saints for heaven. Thus, it is first and foremost about life. Each act, each use of our sexuality must have life as its primary end. This shows how empty and deadly are all the solitary and unnatural uses of our sexuality. These perverted acts make us place our end in the flesh. And those who do this will be nothing but rotting carcasses on that fearful day. And some of them will surely be the most beautiful people who ever walked the earth. And they will be nothing but worm-ridden, rotten carcasses On that day, think about it. Is that what it's about? Use your double vision. Wake up. Furthermore, given that life is the main purpose for the marital act, its secondary purpose is for mutual support in the difficult task of raising children to be saints. Think about how joyful will be the day for the saints like Monica. She worked so hard her whole life to help St. Augustine become a great doctor of grace. How many parents and grandparents will be given the added glory on that day because of their children? And last of all, the marital act is a remedy for the passions of lust, all caused by original sin. 
Lust that can rise up in rebellion at times, causing division and unrest between head and heart. Now note carefully the hierarchy. Keep the hierarchy and you won't sin. First of all, life. Then under that mutual support, they are not equal. It's like this. Number one, number two, number three. If you've got the first one in place, it's easier to keep the other two in place. Then second of all, mutual support. Then finally, last of all, the remedy for concupiscence. If we keep this hierarchy, we will not sin easily. But for those who do not, what will they see on that tremendous day of the king? Will they not be shown how many babies they had or should have had, but did not due to the contraceptive methods and abortions? Will they not be shown what kind of shadows they cast upon the world by their sins? Oh, how evil then are all the forms of contraception, sterilization and abortion that block and kill children. Fourth case. Last case, hatred of neighbor. In the creed, we say, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Although this primarily refers to God forgiving our sins through the sacraments of baptism and penance. Nevertheless, a corollary meaning is that we too, united with God in grace, can forgive sins no matter how bad they are. The gospel indicates that our very salvation is at stake if we do not forgive. The king said, if you do not forgive men, neither will your heavenly father forgive you your transgressions. Yikes. These facts explain why the act of love always includes forgiveness of sins. Oh, my God, I love thee with my whole heart because thou art all good and worthy of all love. I love my neighbor as myself for the love of thee. And I forgive those who have injured me. And ask pardon for those whom I have injured. Amen. St. Thomas More, let's take him as our example. He was falsely accused and held in prison unjustly for a long time. Only to be martyred under King Henry VIII. Now it's a common story of the faithful. We know it. How easy then though it would have been for him to hate King Henry. Made him suffer so unjustly. How did St. Thomas overcome his hatred for his persecutors? Double vision. Here's what he did. As he physically deteriorated and approached death, he wrote how we must realize that if the wicked man convert and go to heaven, we will live together happily with God forever. If he fail to repent, hell is so terrible that were we to see the damned, we would not want our worst enemies to go there. Thus he prayed. Almighty God, make us saved souls in heaven together. Where we may live and love together with thee and thy blessed saints. Wow. By using our double vision, we can overcome all hatred. Thank you, St. Thomas More. You see the pattern. You see how employing employing both eyes can help us overcome any difficulty. By using this double vision well, we will go from grace to grace, producing more and more glory for our king. We will steadily make our way to the inner court of our souls with all our castle dwellers unified under a hierarchy of the heart following the head. We will say go and they go. We will say come. And they will come. What is more, even if we have sinned in the past. The use of our double vision will change all that into glory, just as it did for St. Mary Magdalene. Remember the good thief. He lived a life of sin. But even as he lay dying on the cross, all that changed. By God's grace, all the shadows he might have cast upon the world were changed into light. The same will be true of us who have done past things that might not be so good, that might even cast long, dark shadows upon the world. By our complete conversion, this can be reversed. 
Does not the conversion of a wayward child cause rejoicing in the parents such that the parents easily are disposed to forget the bad he has done? Oftentimes they end up loving that child more than others, more than before, and they will defend him from all attacks. Such conversions are seen and admired by all. In this way, instead of dreading the judgment day, we can look forward to our time to increase the glory and honor due to our king. If only we use both eyes and live, live for that day. Let us end by echoing St. Paul's words. Know you not that your members are the castle of the king of kings who is enthroned in you through baptism? You're not your own. For you are bought with a price, a great price. Glorify and bear the king in your castle of your body. And again, as we heard earlier, may he who hath begun a good work in you at baptism perfect it unto the day of Christ Jesus. And this I pray, that your charity may more and more abound in knowledge and in understanding, go deeper in the castle, that you may approve the better things, that you may be sincere and without offense unto the day of Christ. Viva Cristo Rey! In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.